David, thank you for joining me today. First, let me congratulate the team on achieving these wonderful milestones, creating new AI tools that show great promise at generating new medicines and vaccines. Now, my background as a biophysics undergrad and an AI researcher with a, a PhD in MD didn't quite prepare me for the surprising pace of these advances. The remarkable developments in machine learning are enabling us to go beyond looking with awe at the molecules of biology to participating in the magic with designing new proteins. Now, in the work described in today's publication, you and your team describe new kinds of AI-based autocomplete for proteins, taking snippets with specific proteins as starting points and inflating them into full proteins, taking an in-painting approach to protein design. And you also endow computing systems with the ability to imagine new structures and associated amino acid sequences, ideas about protein hallucination, analogous to AI methods that are being used to generate rich imagery from simple prompts. Can you tell us a bit more about protein hallucination and in-painting? What inspired your team to pursue these novel approaches and what impact do you see of their use? Well, thank you, Eric. And uh, I just have to begin with to say that, you know, we really couldn't have any, done any of this without, uh, without your support. Um, the, um, uh, well, as you mentioned, both, um, both the hallucination and in-painting approaches are really uh, inspired by um, the really, you know, amazing things that deep learning has, deep learning generative models have done in, in other areas. So um, the analog of, of, the, um, of the hallucination uh, for proteins approach, of course, is, um, our, is the ability to take um, a network that say, a train to recognize um, images of cats on, on the internet and, and then generate brand new images of cats that aren't any particular cat, but are, you know, but look like cats. Um, and so in the case of proteins, uh, we have, um, develop methods for, uh, for predicting protein structure from sequence. And we can initialize with random sequences and then optimize those sequences until the network predicts that they will fold into viable protein structures. It's very, and we're essentially doing activation uh, maximization. We're, we're basically optimizing over the input uh, to, to, to achieve um, a, a desired response from the network, not having an image classified as a cat, but having uh, a sequence predicted to be a protein structure. Now, in the case of today of the today's paper, um, we're no longer doing a free hallucination, which we described earlier of, of, of you know, proteins in general, rather we're constraining a functional site. And you can think of that um, as in the cat analogy, we're now specifying the ears of the cat, but nothing else. And so we're asking the network to come up with a sequence that, or an image where the, the ears are in place, but the rest of the cat is kind of free form. And so in the hallucination case, we specify a functional site on a protein, and then the network comes up with, an, with the rest of the sequence. The in-painting approach, uh, you can think of the language models that are used for autocomplete, uh, say when you're typing on, on a word processor in Microsoft Word, for example, you type a few words and it will suggest completions to your sequence, to your sentence. And that's because the language model has, you know, seen very large numbers of sentences and can, you know, has, can make a reasonable prediction about what the rest should be. So here we have Rosetta Fold. It's been seen many, many examples of protein mm -hmm. structures, sequence structure pairs. And we trained it further by um, taking, um, taking protein structures, sequence structure pairs, and removing bits of them and then rebuilding them. And that trained model can take a small part of the protein, of a protein, say a functional site, and extend it out into the rest of the protein, autocomplete, as you said. It's just fabulous. And, and so what, what, what might come of this? Where do you see the things going with these methods? Well, I think it's tremendously exciting. Um, uh, there are um, uh, really, um, you know, I think the, the, the sort of the next generation of protein therapeutics drugs, I think could very well uh, use these methods. Um, really everything that proteins are used for in biology and um, technology, I think will benefit from the ability to now, um, you know, we're all familiar with the advances that were made in structure prediction with deep learning. But I think now that we can use deep learning for protein design, the impact will be even greater. 
So this is not the fir first time uh, you've been part of efforts that took, I would say, what I call the road less traveled with great results. Uh, last November, you and your team published work in science on the use of neural network methods to reason about protein interactions uh, and showed how these could be used to identify previously unknown interactions among proteins in eukaryotic cells, the type of cells that people are comprised of. Uh, the techniques published then uh, demonstrated how AI techniques can provide what I was referring to as new computational lenses on the operation of proteins in cells. The methods and the, uh, and the very cool results resonated with the vision that you and I have brainstormed about uh, of one day developing a comprehensive human protein interactome where we have a, a computational representation of, of a large um, portion of known proteins and their interactions in human cells and use those to serve as a foundation, this kind of interactome knowledge, and, uh, but a foundation for supercharging biology and medicine with enabling fast-paced exploration, simulations, and design. So I, while developing such a human protein interactome uh, and associated tools we've talked about is largely aspirational at this point, what do you want people to understand about its potential in doing that kind of thing? Well, I think there's uh, really tremendous potential. As you said, you know, we, we're, we're getting ever better lenses for looking into the, you know, the core of biology. And biology is very complicated with um, you know, with the, even within a single cell, thousands or tens of thousands of proteins interacting with each other. And I think what we've been able to do is to map the interactions between proteins. Um, but that's only a small part of the story. There's, a, there's, a much, there's very rich additional data on function and localization and, um, uh, say, disease uh, relatedness that I think could all be brought to bear um, um, and, and integrated uh, for um, a, for to really make sort of a common sort of um, working place to really uh, solve biological questions. And I'm very excited about the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Microsoft on that because I think it will require, you know, the, kind, the, the, the really rich and extensive data science and ML expertise that, that Microsoft has to really bring that vision to fruition because there's so many different kinds of data and it's, it's really a, 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 a very interesting problem in data integration. And uh, so I, but I think the potential is enormous. The many of the advances um, um, that have been developed by leveraging um, in, in, in digital biology have been developed uh, by leveraging large data sets. Um, biologists have certainly accrued a great deal of data, um, but they haven't traditionally had great computing power at their fingertips. Our hope in providing you with access to Microsoft's Azure Cloud and expertise for doing large-scale machine learning at cloud scale was to help push the limits of what you could do. Now, it's just been over a year since we publicly announced our collaboration in March 2021. Uh, how has having more processing power with Azure enabled you to do more exploration, take more risks, uh, do the studies and the iterations you need to do to lead to this kind of breakthrough uh, you're reporting today? Well, Eric, it's, it's been just absolutely essential. We, we really, as I said at the beginning, could not have done this uh, without um, uh, without your support and with the Azure resources. So um, as we have been um, developing this in-painting approach, we've been um, in parallel developing Rosetta Fold, and that involves a huge amount of exploration of, of, of different architectures, different possibilities for each one, um, you essentially have to train the models to, to a considerable uh, extent uh, to assess, you know, the differences in performance in, in, in uh, and, and in that takes considerable time. And what we found is every time we come up with a better res res Rosetta Fold model, it has immediately translated into, um, into a big jump in performance in the in-painting design problem. So I would say, you know, I mean, there's just no question that your support has been, has been really absolutely critical to what's described in the paper today. Thanks. There's, there's an important push shift for more collaboration across industry and academia of the form that we're doing. And my sense is, is that it has to go beyond sharing insights, but also to include the sharing of computational resources, frontier algorithms, uh, and the deeper collaboration of passionate people working across industry and academia, uh, both working on the computing side and the bioscience side. Uh, increasingly also at the convergence zone of bio, biology, biocomputing. Uh, we're quite enthusiastic about supporting the IPD and its efforts, 
Uh, we've also relished the opportunity to work alongside you and your teams. Uh, this includes fabulous ongoing research and engineering discussions, interns from your team uh, coming to spend a summer with us. Uh, we've enjoyed. We've learned a great deal and I've done our best to supercharge efforts at the frontiers. And I particularly loved our deep exploratory conversations on next steps and longer term futures. What delights or surprises you the most about the collaboration between our, our two organizations? Well, um, I think I never would have, I, you know, I think of Microsoft as a very large, you know, it's one of the world's leading companies. And I think what surprised and delighted me the most is, is just our extensive conversations, our 10 p.m., you know, once <laughs> it's every always two 10 or three p.m. weeks. <laughs> um, you know, and the fact that, that I can talk to the CTO of Microsoft about leading latest problems in protein design and um, uh, that you can make, um, you know, you know, great suggestions and then, um, you know, making available the, the compute power to really follow through on these ideas. I, I just utterly never would have guessed. I mean, um, and, and so uh, and that's just been it's been just a really, really fun uh, thing. And it's it's just had a major impact on our research. And this is, this is to clarify, our CTO is Kevin Scott, a Microsoft's chief scientific officer, CSO. Yes. My, CSO, my okay. role is to help us understand, to imagine, to invest, uh, to prepare for the future of scientific methods and discovery uh, and new computational tools and methods, roadmaps and pathways that can help us achieve uh, new possibilities and dreams for people and society. So it, it, it may be hard, though, for, for, for many to understand how the work you're doing today uh, will influence our lives in 5, 10 or 25 years from now. Can you just, you've already mentioned a few ideas about this, but just to, just, as, just to wrap up, give us a glimpse into the future. How will our lives be fundamentally different because of this research work and the work of your colleagues working on harnessing AI and biology? Well, let me close with just two examples to, that, that illustrate the range. The first is pandemic preparedness. So what we would like to have, I, I should say that um, we have sort of an exciting accomplishment at the Institute for Protein Design. Um, our designed uh, COVID vaccine has now been approved for use in humans and doses will start going into people. So exciting. Um, so that's our first approved medicine. Um, we also have a COVID therapeutic and a, a prophylactic that's headed for clinical trials. What we And it took us a year or so after the, from when the pandemic began to develop these. We'd like to, we are working towards methods where from the identification of the sequence of a pathogen within you know, just a couple of weeks to have really, really potent uh, vaccine and uh, therapeutic candidates. So on end. Yeah, I, on I, the far. Yeah, I don't keep. Yeah. I keep asking you for for the for the for that. When's that nasal spray coming? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So that's that. That will be going into uh, clinical trials um, here. So on the completely yeah. other extreme, we're also very interested in incorporating uh, design proteins into silicon devices, where the atomic control of proteins. Can can be able to, could be used to do things that are hard to do, you know, with silicon. But it's but there's a very close interface. So basically, to enable things like detection, uh, sensing, um, maybe even new forms of computation. So really ranging from spanning from from you know medicine all the way through to technology, and uh, we're also working on new light harvesting systems. Um, plastic degradation. There's just so many different things that proteins can do. And uh, we're really excited about the, the possibilities of transforming medicine and technology in all of these areas. So exciting and so great. Well, thank you, David. I always totally enjoy our chats and brainstorming and congratulations on these fabulous results being presented uh, today in science. Thanks so much. Thank you.